Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It is once again time for the Wadcast. I'm one of your hosts, Josh, joined with me, as always, by the laziest man in California, Brandon. Yeah, yeah, the laziest. I wish. What's up, everybody? Happy Friday nights. It's good to be back for another show. Um, yeah, it's, it's just good to be able to hang out and have the downtime to be able to discuss things that Josh and I are very passionate about, such as the film and television and entertainment industry altogether. And um, Furby's. And Furbies, yes, 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 and Hello Kitty thongs too. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, we are not in a paid partnership with Hello Kitty, nor are we in a paid partnership with a thong manufacturing company. But I would like to say that mine is very comfortable right now. But the, that's not the point. Um, I, the point is that we discuss film, television, writers, actors, directors, and every single thing in between. And on tonight's episode, we actually have a special guest that a um, friend of uh, Josh's actually that he's worked with on a few things. Is that that is a, uh, yeah, you, yeah, you, would you like to uh, introduce our guest and get him out of the uh, apparent green room? I didn't know that we even had. Yeah, we have, we have a green room for guests. You did, Must be new. You, you haven't been backstage? No, 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 no. I'm in California. Oh, well. Okay. Um, well, uh, tonight's special guest is none other than local uh, uh, filmmaker. Uh, Royce Freeman. And I'll tell you right now, real quick, not to cut you off, but if the green room backstage is is, is behind me. Definitely. definitely. I know. I know what I did. I know what I did. But if the green room is behind me through that door in my office, which would lead into my living room Mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Yeah. And, you know, Royce is out there waiting for us. Like, I'm going to shit myself. You know that, right? Yeah, that's exactly. Okay. Exactly. I was going to. Okay. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Please uh, introduce her. Well, I just completely lost my train of thought. Thank you. For that, you you, you uh, ended at Freeman. Yeah, it's gone. So, uh, <laughs> in anticipation for uh, Royce's appearance on the show, sent me a little something for you to uh, peruse while uh, we uh, bring him out from the green room. So, check this out: upcoming project from Royce Freeman. <laughs> Film is a fickle mistress. Um, You have to kind of decide, you know, how much you're going to invest in attracting it, recognizing that it will go away. I don't take it too serious. Even though I've given away half my life to filmmaking, you can't take it serious. You, it will, filmmaking will, will break your heart. The only sin is being boring. Determination, determination. With that scrappy dog, I think we can overcome anything. We do this for the love. It challenges me. Sometimes you catch lightning in a bottle. And welcome to the show, Royce. How's it going? Doing all right. Doing all right. Thanks for having well, me. Yeah, welcome back <laughs> from the green room, i.e. my living room, apparently, since it's uh, backstage, and backstage would be behind me. Oh, yeah, yeah. The green um, room has, has nice, uh, delicious beverages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we okay, that's not my living room because I, uh, I drank Coke, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> drink. Um, so, <laughs> what, what we just saw there God. was uh, a trailer for the upcoming documentary. Uh, Royce, what what is this this documentary that that we just saw a trailer for? So, I've been working in Jacksonville since 2009, and you know, each one of the different people I've worked with has exposed me to different aspects of our town, and I learned you know, recently through uh, a mutual, um, um, well, actually, it's funny, the six degrees is Kevin Bacon kind of thing. You know some people that know people I know. And one of the guys that we know kind of together is this guy, Chad Hendricks, 
and he's been doing um, urban films since the early 2000s, late 90s. And through knowing him, I actually discovered that 100 years before Chad, there was a guy during the silent era in Jacksonville. Because si Jacksonville was the uh, silent film hub. Um, like, there was no Hollywood. New York and Chicago, they got cold. So they came down to Jacksonville to warm up and shoot, you know, all year round. And they opened the studio, Norman Studios. And Nor Richard Norman was the guy who was doing all black casts. But he was doing positive represent representation where they were pilots and lawyers and doctors and, you know, not playing, you know, criminals and, and demeaning roles. <clears throat> and so he was a champion for the po that positive representation. And then cut to... 100 years later, um, you know, Chad's doing that kind of stuff, but he's doing it with people that rap and zombies and, you know, he's doing that kind of stuff, but doing it with panache and flair and, 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 and uh, uh, I guess uh, a beat, you know, a rap, a, a hip hop beat, you know, um, but so many filmmakers have said that he actually has inspired them to, you know, oh, if he can do it, we can do it. And then I cut, you know, 20 years later. Now, there's so many filmmakers that have all, he's uh, bla uh, trailblazed and, and trendsetted, you know. So now there's, there's a whole community of people that they may not know his name, but they wouldn't be here if it wasn't for what he started years, years ago. Now, uh, that's a long-winded answer, I know, but. <laughs> it, it's, it's a good answer. It's a good it, answer. It was a good and answer. You've, um, Put together a documentary to to talk about his work as well as the the work of some you know other Jacksonville and artists. Oh yeah, for sure, and and it's <clears throat> it's segmented into chapters, so each chapter is about a different thing. Um, you know, the, the beginning is about the similarity between the past and Chad and those other filmmakers, but then it deals with other topics. Like we have nationwide, we have the 48 hour film project, mm -hmm. which happens every year in all the major cities and the big winners from all those cities, they get together and it's always at a different place, like at the Super Bowl. At the end of every year, they have Filmapalooza, which is a place internationally now where, because now 48 hour film project is an international festival across mm -hmm. the globe so now they move it around from rotterdam to you know la to orlando and this year coming up's in lisbon portugal mm. um and so there's a section that deals with the many different people that have shepherded the 48 um then there's other festivals i don't know if you've ever met richard kodai um oh, yeah. did... uh, we first met during shoot the messenger yeah so R richard kodai he had this thing called the Short Film Showcase back in the, the mid-2010s. I think it was 2014 was the first one. And he did it at his Sunray for many years. And just like follow the bouncy ball, if it wasn't for him doing that at Sunray, Adam and Monique Madrid wouldn't have thought of doing the LOL. And no, because they started the LOL, they became city producers of the 48. So one thing leads to the next. If there was no Richard Kodai... Maybe Adam and Monique wouldn't have gotten to where they are as the city producers of Jacksonville for the 48. Maybe they would have eventually, but they would have come to it maybe a different way. They definitely wouldn't have come up with the LOL. I, I'm definitely sure of that because Monique said that they came up with the idea of the LOL sitting in the back row of Richard Kodai's show. So, you know, it, it, one thing leads to another and it's, it's, it, it's amazing what you discover doing a documentary because I'm a big documentary fan. You know, if I have a choice between buying a Blu-ray that has no special features and then for five, six, seven dollars extra, there's the loaded disc that has the deleted scenes, documentaries, commentaries, all the goodies. I'm going to spend a couple extra bucks to find out how they made the movie. So um, I, I, I guess I discovered that I kind of want to be that guy that tells you how I made the movie. You know, I, I am just, I'm really loving this documentary process because it's, I can go into it with a mindset of this is the story I want to tell. 
but when you're dealing with real people, they basically write the script. You know, you tell you go in with an idea, but until they start talking, you don't know what's gonna what the story's gonna be. Oh yeah. And this documentary has taken so many different forms over the last year and a half that it's been production. I've restructured the edit a couple of times based on new information because I wanted to tell the most compelling, truthful story. So the the narrative, the through line has take on mul taken on multiple forms while you've been uh, oh, yeah. in editing? Oh, yeah. It was a longer documentary when I didn't have one major component in the documentary. And once I discovered this piece of information, it forced my hand to restructure the um, the documentary into the form it is now. And it's a, it's a leaner documentary. It, I, I feel it actually it's shorter, but yet it has more information. You know, I just found a way to be streamlining it so it can still tell a lot of stuff, but just moving fast. Okay. So it's like, I mean, like the documentary, it's like, um, how long have you been working on this now? November of 22. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So like, you know, it's coming up like the, the year and a half mark, roughly. Um, and you, that's would, like you would think, you would think that everybody would just be dying to be in it but there's some people that are camera shy some people that are camera shy unless it's something that they you know like spearheaded like some people that didn't want to be in it god bless them like i love their work and everything they are selective about what they're in so it didn't you know that they were supportive from afar of me doing this piece they just didn't want to be in it you know and, See, I, and one person one person said well, I'm on the upward trajectory and on the rise in some of the things they're trying to do. And they're like, you know how when a, a, a person is needing to run for some kind of position or whatever, they have a teleprompter. Yeah. They have somebody writing the speech for them so yeah. they don't say the wrong thing. Well, I've mm -hmm. had people say to me, well, at my day job, you know, I have certain things going on or, or I'm trying to, you know, get on an upward trajectory with this thing I'm trying to do. I don't want to be put in a position where they're like, I trust you. I, I respect you, all this good stuff. I don't know that I want to be in something where unintentionally my words can be jumbled up somehow and it paints me in a less than desirable light. Yeah. And they didn't, they didn't think that I would necessarily do that, but they were worried that unintentionally it could happen just based on sometimes if you tell a long story and you have to cut it up for time, you take out all the little in-between beats. Well, somehow by com c compacting it or taking a comment out of context, I may not realize the context is so important that taking the comment out of it and just using it as a little filler comment might actually be damning. Yeah, and, and some people are worried about that image that they don't want somehow their image to be damning. So some people are selective about if they are part of it, which is fine. I mean, there's... So many people to fill in those gaps that the story doesn't seem to miss having certain people in it. Although it would be, you know, if I had my druthers, everybody would be in it. But you can't get everybody. Yeah. I mean, I, I get the whole, like, not want to be on camera part. Like, I mean, I, I hope that you find more support from people uh, that are interested in discussing things that, like, not just that they spearhead, but the things that they actually do. Um, I actually had talked to Josh about this uh, a while back. We had this thing that we discussed years ago about agent uh, when we were like, you know, like I want to say like 2013 or 14, Josh and I were just like kicking this idea around and I came out to California. I got a group and I just, you know, uh, made it. Uh, we shot a, a, like a nine minute episode in a span of about like eight hours. Available on um, Amazon Prime. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, we had this guy, Anthony, I was going around and getting like the uh, the behind the scenes for like all the BTS, everything. Um, and I was taking a break because we were breaking on the set and resetting somewhere else, uh, trying to get the camera set back up, get like, like, so I can prepare like the blocking and everything. Um, and Anthony comes over as I'm sitting down in this chair and he starts talking to me and I don't like being on camera. Um, this right here, is the closest you'll ever see me to being on camera anywhere discussing anything. Cause it's like, this is me hanging out with like, you know, like a good friend of mine that I've known for years. 
and meeting new people such as yourself, Royce. So it's like I didn't for know me, you and Royce knew each other so long. That's why I like did this, Josh. You. Oh, you meant me. Hey, you jackass. Uh, so <laughs> the thing is, like, so then meeting other people, like, you know, as I, I said with you, um, or as, uh, it's one of those deals where I I will stay as far away from a camera as possible. Like, I, I think, if I remember right, I think I grabbed uh, one of the production assistants. I stood up. I'm like, Don't oh, say yeah. it. Don't say it like, like that. Don't say it like that. Oh, I can make jokes about you, Josh. You better be. <laughs> hey, Vince McMahon just went down. Don't say it like that. Yeah, well, you know, Vince McMahon gave up. Uh, <laughs> he could have kept fighting. That means. I don't know. This no, is kind of good. No, no but, <laughs> no, but the thing is, what I'm getting at, though, is like I grabbed one of the production assistants and I grabbed him. I put him in the chair where I was sitting. I'm like, Anthony, interview him. And I walked away. And then it's like, well, you're directing it. You wrote it. I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, I've got to go do stuff. And I just started moving things around just so I would look busy. I realized if you walk fast, you look busy. So I just was doing that back and forth. And, you know, apparently I look more like I was insane than anything else. So it was like, I, I, I kind of get like certain people that like if they don't prefer to be on camera because uh, some level of shyness. Like with me, it's like out of like just being cripplingly shy and like in front of people. Uh, or like for people to see, but uh, have have they given you like a reason as to why they may not want to be on camera? Is it just like, well, <clears throat> I don't know entirely, so I don't want to speak out of turn. Plus, I'm also not naming names, so I can be oh, vague. Oh, I can also, absolutely. but I can be vague because I'm not actually naming anybody. I like um, there have been some people that they weren't sure about intentions going in not because they didn't trust me but they just you know they were skeptic about the whole idea of uh chronicling and showcasing an entire community and nope. you know how okay. how are you going to uh, juggle so many different diverse voices without pinning them against each other because you end up you end up with so many people that on one issue they feel one way and one issue that, that there's half of the other people feel a completely and and the documentary is truthful no, so it sorry. doesn't say um i mean i guess it, even a documentarian person even the honest ones that are not trying to you know make a propaganda piece um yes technically if you watch the movie and you really think long and hard about the narrative structure i am kind of putting my opinion in it a little just based on how i'm choosing to edit it yeah. But I'm trying to be as truthful as possible and be new, uh, Switzerland, you know. You know, you got people that say, I don't like this. And you got people that say, I do like this. Well, now you got two points of view. Um, one filmmaker is does act sometimes, but doesn't always act in other people's stuff as much. So they, they, are, they, they definitely are uh, protective of their branding. Okay. No, no. Which I, I, which I, I, get, I get that. that. I mean, yeah. there's lots of people that are protective of their brand. Josh, you're so not protective of your brand at all. It's me. I you're think right. I, I don't me. think either one of us are really protective of our brand, Josh. To get me into something, all you have to do is slide into my DMs and I'm there. Yeah. Henry Nader's in the doc. Um, I interviewed him about a year ago. We interviewed him at Sunray. Uh, so we interviewed, interviewed Cynthia at Sunray as well, um, and Josh Townsend. Okay. All three uh, people that I uh, enjoy being around very much. And you know what? Uh, you, you've mentioned it a couple times uh, there already. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and shout out Sunray. They've they've been very supportive of you know the Jacksonville film community for oh, years. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The last time, I don't remember if, if it was before or after Henry had the screening of the exchange there, but it was it was an event. And and I know when it comes to, to screening local films, they, they don't have to be as supportive as they are, but they always choose to like be there helping everybody out. Uh, so we all have a great time watching, you know, the films that are made in our community. Uh, just have fun. 
one thing I can Justin. speak to um, <clears throat> is I've had plenty of uh, ex interactions with uh, the people that run, the lovely people that run the Sunray, Tim and Shana. Um, they've been doing so much uh, uh, pro bono type, you know, giving to the community for so long as far as, you know, not charging, not charging so much or giving, um, doing things on goodwill, you know, okay, we'll hook you up here, but, you know, hook us up over here. That way it's, it's a give and take because the community has been so used to getting all that uh, for so long, the business model at the theater has changed a little. And I completely understand where, where they're coming from, where now they have, they have to keep the lights on. So they can't necessarily always be as, you know, whatever, as they used to be. Yeah. But they're still kind about it. They're saying, look, you know, it's not necessarily personal. It's, you know, it's business to keep the lights on. We still have to charge X amount of thing. Or if you're going to, if we're going to give you this discount, we're, you're going to have to make sure that people, you know, buy their popcorn, you know, so that there's some, you know, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing. That's not exactly how they phrase all that. But um, I would say to the people in the community, if you want to have your stuff showcased and uh, premiered at Sunray, you know, it's worth it um, to make a deal with them because it's certainly cheaper than trying to rent out a venue at AMC or Regal, you know? Oh, absolutely. It might cost more. It might cost more than you're willing to pay, but it's certainly less than you would have to pay at those other places, for sure. Not at all. I would also think just the the optics, the the feeling, if oh, you yeah. will, of of having your your you know Jacksonville film community showing up to see a Jacksonville film in a Jacksonville you know theater. Oh yeah, has it's a good feeling. Well, R.I.P. Uh, San Marco Theater because that was that was the yeah. oldest theater oh, yeah. in oldest oldest cinema in Jacksonville. Florida theater's older, but um, the oldest cinema in Jacksonville, I think, was the San Marco. And when they closed it for completely business reasons, the landlord, you know, wanting this money, money, money and and which is mm -hmm. a damn shame because they they just went through a renovation prior to them having to close their doors. <clears throat> You know, yeah. they they turned the place into a palace. It was it was really lavish and nice and all this kind of stuff. They added another auditorium. You know, they bought the, the neighboring storefront, tore down the wall, added a hall, and they just turned it. Now you had two screens, and then something happened uh, that I'm not privy to all this stuff, but something happened that it was all primarily, you know, stupid politics and money. And then so, a landmark of our community is now shut down. And I've been told that even though they might keep the name San Marco on the on the, on the front, I, which I don't know if that's still true, but I heard they're turning it into some kind of a clothing store or some kind of thing that it's like, what happened to the, you know, the, the <clears throat> heritage and the culture and the and, and remembering our roots? No, people aren't going to walk through San Marco area and be like, "Oh, that's an amazing department store." You know, they're going to they're going to mourn the loss of this cinema house. Well, I mean, from what I've seen, last time I was in uh, Florida, which was Josh, when was it? Like uh, November, I think. November Something was, like that. Somewhere around, like uh, yeah, November. You, early, you were supposed to go to that's, South Florida for yes, Thanksgiving. Yes, yes, that's right. I was. Um, yeah, like I mean, I'm I'm a Florida native, like I'm a Jacksonville native. So it's like with me, um, I was raised between New Jersey and Jacksonville Beach throughout my entire life. Uh, so Jacksonville Beach, like, uh, like from what I saw of Jacksonville, they are changing so much there with the independent every well, just like in general, like the entire landscape of Jacksonville is changing uh completely topsy topsy turvy. Uh so the things that made Jacksonville special. And for, I, I heard all about the San Marco theater. I never got a chance to go there after the renovations because I have not been on that side of town in a long time, but I remember being there when I was younger uh, and it was, it was an okay theater. Then it was like kind of, you know, no offense to anyone, but it was kind of a ghetto theater when I was younger. It was like, well, it was not a great looking place, but I heard so much about the renovations yeah. Uh, and then I heard about them closing it. I never got a chance to see the renovations after it was, I saw pictures. I'm like, oh, it looks great. 
I've been in there a couple of times. I went in there when I first moved to Jacksonville, and it was a grindhouse kind of vibe. I went to a midnight. Yes. Sc- yes. I went to a midnight screening of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and they had a. It, it was they played a shitty old print, so it was all dirty and, you know, it, well, it was how you imagine Texas Chainsaw Massacre when you. Yeah, watched yeah, it on, yeah, yeah. When you watched it on a home video when you were a child, a kid, that shitty, gr- uh, gritty, you know, yeah. grainy print. Well, that, that was how it looked in the theater. Um, and then when they renovated it, my wife and I uh, went and saw um, the uh, the Murder on the Orient Express when they the, the remake with uh, Kenneth Branagh. Oh yeah, yeah we went and yes. saw that. That was that was fun. Uh, a local filmmaker, Franklin Rich, he had a premiere of his movie Teardrop Goodbye, uh, and uh, that was that played at the San Marco Theater. Um, it's it's a, it was a fun little place. Um, and San Marco Theater and Sunray are, are completely different as far as the layout and everything, but they both felt like you were stepping into a piece of history. Oh, yeah. See, one thing I will say that I adore about Jackson is, um, like, and it comes largely when it comes to uh, independent filmmakers. See, out here in Los Angeles, if you were to make a movie, and I've had, I've had a make these expenses a few times um but if you're filming something out here um and it is six hundred dollars per location per day so out here if you want to film like say like two locations um i think they even said that if it's like facing that way that's one location but if you're five steps away from where you're filming that's considered a second location if it's Mm -hmm. if it's not by the address it's a second location so you need a permit for that location too so you have to like eat, you know get smart with the filmmaking of everything. But it's six hundred dollars per location per day, so that's like a twelve hundred dollar day. I will say this: what I love about Jacksonville is how supportive they are of the independent film community. You know, they are changing the landscape, not so much what like I don't want to say that they're changing like how films are made, but they're changing the landscape. They're like again, my hometown, like Jacksonville Beach, is unrecognizable these days compared to what it was, say, even like thirteen years ago. I mean, on like um, third, third, third Street in Jacks Beach. Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. uh my yeah my family all lived off of uh what was it uh Thirteenth Street North, no um, more off, of, off of uh, off of Penman Road and uh, Beach Boulevard. Like just go down Penman Road, get to like you know whatever. So that's over um, by um the Jack's Beach that was like uh, Joe's Crab Shack and, and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, but uh, like you, you, they're changing a lot. Like while they're changing the landscape and making it borderline unrecognizable to me, which breaks my heart every time I see more changes there. Um. I will say I I cherish and adore the fact that they have kept it to where they do not charge for permits for filmmaking. I love that about Jacksonville because I mean I was like you know Josh and I were like this whole bad agent thing. We were right. We wrote out like like Josh, myself, and uh, the actor that played the lead character uh, Simon in the series. Um, the actor this, this actor's name is Brian Wallace. You know, friend Brian. of the show, friend of mine, great dude, A really really cool guy. Um, we were writing this and we were talking to Brian about maybe filming it in Jacksonville because there are parts of Jacksonville that look almost identical to parts of Los Angeles. Um, it's almost uncanny at times, but, uh, and that's only because of the fact that for us to set up a film crew and everything else would be cheaper for me to fly. Like a few of the actors to Florida and film there without any permits whatsoever, or I'm sorry, a uh, film with, uh, the, like, you know, non, I guess like the, the free permits, as I call them, like, just like, you just have to file for the things. Um, but beyond that, like, it's just like, yeah, like I, I heard about um, other things that they've been changing. I have uh, kept up to date on a few things. I like the fact that there are, I, I believe that there are a few more festivals that people are trying to put together, at least like coordinates, uh, not so much in Jacksonville, but in Northeast Florida and uh, even Southern Georgia. But I love how filmmaking friendly Jacksonville has become over the years. I love how it's actually become like its own thing over the last, like I want to say like 10 to 15 years, like film independent filmmaking is really, you know, skyrocketed in Jacksonville in the last like decade and a half. Um, so I want to ask you, where are you from originally? Cause you said like well, when you moved to Jacksonville. Well, I am uh, all over the East coast. Uh, okay. I was raised in New York and okay. then in, as a teenager, I lived in uh, Miami until my early 20s, and then I moved up to Jacksonville, uh, Orange Park area. Oh, okay. Oh, well, and Josh's neck of the woods, nearby there. Yeah, yeah, more or less. Yeah. 
So, I mean, like, so, so I mean, what what got you into filmmaking? My dad was a photographer when before I was born, um, and he dealt with thirty five millimeter, sixteen millimeter. You know, he may have dealt with eight millimeter. I don't actually know, yeah. but um, but he's dealt with film his whole life until he got out of the film business. Uh, but he in New York was was he had his own company. And he, he's worked for other people, but he had his own company. He freelanced and did a lot of stuff. And when I was a kid, you know, before going into formal schooling and also on, you know, snow days, you know, being from up north, you yep. from Jersey, from Jersey, you know about uh, the snow days. Oh, yeah. That, uh, you know, when there was no school, <laughs> he might he might take me also to his office. So I, I sat there and, and drew and played on the computer and watched him do stuff in his film studio so i got to watch him splice film and deal with he had a uh a, the camera points down on a, a stand and you would frame by frame animate so you know he could do uh, stop motion and um animation stuff like that but you know it's 40 something years 30 something 40 years ago so i don't m remember entirely all the finer details but i know yeah. that my informative years was going to the office when I was a way really young kid, watching him do pretend and and making his art. Um, and then you know, when I was in high school and middle school and high school, I took creative writing for many years, and then I started getting into writing screenplays. Um, and then in college, I went to film school. So okay, uh, my dad retired formally from film before we went to Miami. Um, and then he did computer programming for a long time when I, um, was in college and then started doing my own films, my dad kind of started helping me, you know, and <laughs> the price is right. You know, I got my dad's services and expertise for free. Oh yeah. So, uh, ever since I've been working with my dad, um, you know, we've been, uh, I, my company, Freeman Films, and uh, it's father and son working together. And uh, he puts this extra sheen and gloss and style on um, on his on the work that I do. And some people have said that uh, the projects that he doesn't work on with me, the ones that he uh, uh, wasn't able to or whatever, yeah. even if they don't even if they don't see his name not on it, they see that it's a different feel. It's a different style, you know, if I have someone else assisting me with some of the post work. Um, I'm sure that I would only guess that when you were speaking to Henry Nader, because his father is a musician and he got raised in that environment and his, you know, his wife is an artist and, you know, it's an art, artistic family that I'm sure Henry was informed by watching his dad, you know, create his art. Um, and it's the same is true for me. I wouldn't be who I am. Well, I wouldn't be, a, I wouldn't be me at all if my dad never met my mother, you know, yeah. but uh, if my dad wasn't a filmmaker, I don't think I would be who I am. I might be pushing a pencil somewhere in an office, maybe not being as fulfilled. Okay. I'm wondering what the best stapler is. Yeah. 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 They took my red stapler. Excuse me. You, 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 you took my safety. <laughs> But it's like, the thing is, uh, you've actually you've done quite a bit. Um, I just, uh, ladies and gentlemen, actually, I, I have um, Royce's, um, you know, like ever, his resume pull, not resume, but like his IMDb pulled up here. And uh, you know, director, you've got twenty credits in your belt, at least on IMDb. And like, if you work in the industry, you know that the IMDb is not exactly, it's it's not gospel. Um, you could, you, you have to update this. You have to either get up, you either have to update it yourself or it has to be updated by somebody else. You have to get tagged in it. Uh, things like that. Like that's really how your IMDB gets built. Right. Um, but it's like, as far as just like for, you know, argumentative sake and director roles and writers, um, credits, uh, you have, uh, it says 20 credits as director, 20 credits as writer, uh, uh 27 as a producer. And uh, what was it here? Uh, the editor, yeah, the editing you've done, fourteen credits, and acting it says uh, ten. So you've you've been on camera, you've been behind camera, you've been uh, away from camera, working on the 
post-production part of things, um, everything you've done all, like you've just been on a lot of facets of the production process. Uh, That's but I want to, I want to ask you as far as like, <clears throat> I have people that I am acquainted with out here that, and even on, on social media that asked me about like how I got into writing and I told them like, you know, how I got into writing is whatever. And I guess like Josh going back to bad agent again, or even like, you know, like things I did before, like, I moved out to LA, like films I had made or music videos I directed. I get asked about the whole, uh, you know, like when you write or direct something, like what's it like seeing? And I told me it's pretty awesome. Like when you write something, but when you direct it, what you, the final product is nothing like what you wrote or how you envisioned it at least. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that? Like when you write something and you actually, you get to being able to film it and you're directing it. Uh, what are your thoughts like when you're seeing it go down? Is, are you seeing it like, oh, this is exactly how I imagined it? Or is it like, okay, this is not what I wanted, but I want to make the best of what I have with this to where I can make it better? Like, how do you look at things throughout the filmmaking process after you write something? Unless you do it all yourself, and even then, this is hyperbole, but unless you do it all yourself, and I, I, I suppose if you write it or if you animated it, you know, where you have complete control over stick figures or animation where the actors are even an extension of your work, then you would have complete control over, um, you know, non-existing people, you know, pro uh, stick figures, and then you would, you, would get, you would get it exactly how you want. When you're dealing with other people, especially if you're not paying them, you know, but if you're dealing with other people, if somebody only gives you what you want, I would think that that would be a disservice that, you know, they say that uh, the best directing is good casting. And that's yeah. not only casting of people in front of the camera, but it's 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 uh, fielding the team like they refer to for sports. Who's going to yeah. be a pitcher? Who's going to be an outfield and who's going to be running, you know, a short stop? Who's going to be in all these positions and a well-oiled machine? is you know you know there's no squeaky wheel so i would say that when i cast it right i don't have to do that much directing you know you go in and you give a couple of little little directions see i like but that. i don't give a line reading i never micromanage and if i know somebody needs a little nudge but they're also self-conscious i try to nudge them in the direction of what i'm hoping for you know and not blatantly say do it this way and I'm sure there's directors that will eventually get frustrated and say, do it, just do it this way. And I, I don't do that. Um, I try to find a, a sideways way around that to get what I want. Um, and then the same thing with the crew. I've, uh, if you get a good cinematographer who you like their style, I mean, you, you don't want to ask um, a painter who is an impressionistic painter to be, to paint you something mm -hmm. that is a different kind of, it, whatever their style is, you don't want to get a cinematographer that's good for doing one thing and ask them to do something they just don't do. Yeah. And they get, and they get frustrated when they can't, you know, if you don't, if you want somebody that can do what you're looking for, then you get the person that can do that. You know, that's already good at doing that. Um, you know, John Williams is an amazing composer. He's not Danny Elfman, nor should he be. They're two different flavors. And they're two amazing flavors, but they're not the same, you know. Um, you know, I was on set for the for most of the shooting of Henry Nader's film, The Exchange, and I watched him work, and I didn't say much. I just kept my mouth shut and did the best job I could, and just was a fly on the wall. And I learned so much from watching him. And he knew what he wanted, and he worked around people that knew that knew how to give him what he wanted. But he also left left room for people to uh, uh, interpret a little and to contribute, yeah. Because he realized, you know, he realized that we had so much to offer that he maybe didn't wasn't even aware of that we could do. Um, it was one time I was setting up, uh, you know, J J uh, Chitty knows some of these same people uh, when Cynthia and Gordo, you know, when we were dealing with setting up lighting. Especially, I think at, at Gordon's house when we were doing stuff at Gordon's house. Um, when we were doing that stuff, the uh, I know they were dealing with a million things. 
So I had to set, help set up some lights. And they basically said, just do what you feel you need to do. Just, this is the scene. We know the camera's me pointing in this direction. And so just, you know, light it. They trusted that I knew how to do what they needed me to do. He didn't tell me how to light it. He just said, light it. So yeah, yeah. I knew he was dealing with film. So I knew I had to blow up the hell out of it to give him an exposure. Because you get a different kind of uh, exposure on film than you would on digital. So, you know, um, so much so that he was about to roll camera. And I realized that there was a piece of information that I didn't have about what he was hoping to achieve. And before he rolled camera, before he rolled camera, I actually said, whoa, 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 don't roll camera yet. He goes, what's wrong? I said, I realize what you're trying to shoot. And I didn't know entirely what that was. Uh, 10 minutes ago when I was setting up the lights, I said, there's a gel that's on that camera that is the wrong gel. And you need, I need to do this to give you what you need. And he appreciated that I, that I caught that mistake and that I, we, that I was able to um, just correct the, you know, what needed to be done and just execute it. I didn't, I didn't burden him with worrying about what the problem was. I didn't burden him with X, Y, and Z. I just said, I noticed this. It'll take me five minutes to fix it and we're going to fix it. And he said, we'll do it. So I did. And then uh, we got the shot and it was a great shot. And so, but it's, it's great when you have a, a team that trusts each other and also, um, you know, gives the respect. Cause I, I think that most people will give you the shirt off their back if they can, you know, I mean, if, you know, the, but, but most people will give you the shirt off their back if they just know that you're going to appreciate the efforts that, you know, some people, they walk around and, you know, they stick their hand out and they want things, but they're never even going to thank you for it. And I never felt a single day on the set of Henry's movie where he didn't feel, he, I always saw him appreciating and thanking everybody that was giving their time. He thanked everybody when we all showed up. And when we worked the wee hours of the night, we were dead on our feet. Those who were left standing, <laughs> uh, he all he just thanked us, and you, know, you got the bro hug and the handshake and the, you know, the he what is it the the, the the say they say he gave everybody their flowers. Okay. Uh, Josh, do you have any questions? You're 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 still muted. Well, yeah, of course I'm muting you because I didn't want to, you know, have my. Uh, I just, I just feel like I have to remind you that you're muted because you keep forgetting that you're muted. Okay, that's true. Talking all that smack before the show even started, it was like, like I could hear a damn thing you're saying. So, uh, mm hmm, mm hmm. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll toss this out there. I don't know if anybody else felt this way working on um, Henry's projects and, and, I, I laugh every time I think about it a bit, but as, as an actor, you know, for, for Henry and, and like you said before, he uses film. Yeah. He, he's, he's like keeping it alive around here. Every time I'm about to go, I'm like, I, I think to myself, Oh Lord, this is costing money. I can't screw up. I can't screw up. And um, so far, I haven't been slapped, <laughs> so I guess I'm doing okay. But you know, it, it is, uh, uh, you know, it's 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 in the back of your mind that you know because it's you know it's shooting film and you know digital. It's like take 537. We'll get it eventually. But no, when you're when you're paying for the processing for actual cells it's something else but you, you mentioned something earlier about you know tight-knit teams tight-knit teams people people calling on each other and and in that regard i've definitely seen 
the the film community in Jacksonville sort of um, rallying uh, at at several points to just to make sure you know somebody's vision can can be brought to life. Uh, one name uh, and and one job in particular, I I think I've been hearing come up uh, more frequently is. Royce Freeman and cinematography. It seems, it seems, Royce, you've, uh, I don't know, become a go-to for some people to to kind of get get these shots. Well, when it kind of started, well, it started about ten years ago plus when I was doing my first film, Rapture, and we this this cinematographer. The, his name is Mark Dakaj. He's not with us, uh, sadly. Um, I met him doing some reshoots on a previous thing that he was helping me with. And he saw that I had a budget because the uh, financier came into an inheritance and he wanted to parlay that money into a, a feature. And so we had some money to play with. And uh, he... So we were able to hire a cinematographer and he had his own cameras. So when you hire the, the artist, sometimes he, you get the paintbrushes for free <laughs> or rather you're, you're, you're paint, you're, you're renting the paintbrushes and you get the artist for free, whichever you want to. Um, but, but it's all lumped in together and he knew me. So he was giving me a friendly rate, but we started to realize that we were going to um, not be able to meet our deadline of, of shooting at the rate we were shooting if we didn't get a second camera. So he knew somebody with a second camera, so we rented that. And he said, but I don't have anybody to run it. And I had been to film school and I, I took direction very well. So even though I was the director, my cinematographer was like, we'll shoot crisscross shots over the shoulders. We'll shoot crisscross shots. And he set up those settings on my camera. And he said, this is gonna be your shot. We agreed on the shots. So he says, you, because you're not the, the skilled cinematographer yet, you point the camera, what we agree on, and his camera will do the moving around and doing the wa extra wacky stuff, but mine will stay stationary. And so that way it always was gonna be in focus and all that good stuff. So we shot an entire movie together so half of a movie, I was the co-cameraman. And so I had that experience. It also gave me the confidence, because I was dealing with the camera, that I pretty much could do sometimes whatever I wanted. Because he goes, hey, for this scene, I'll point at this. You do whatever you want. And if, it, if, if, it, if the shot isn't usable entirely, we still have mine. And mine meaning his. So... It gave me the confidence to just do that because I wasn't having to communicate what I wanted to someone else. I just could just do stuff. And, you know, I tried some wacky stuff and I liked some of the stuff I got. Years later, I started to need to, you know, somebody was supposed to come like for that documentary. Somebody was supposed to come and shoot something. They couldn't show up. I just so happened the universe knew, seemed to know that was going to happen. Um, I have a habit of when I finish a film shoot, it's much like when you go on a vacation and you forget to unpack because you're tired or whatever. Well, my lights and my stands and stuff sometimes just sit in my back of my uh, wagon my 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 um, that I drive around. And so I was at a film shoot. This one guy wasn't going to be able to make it. I happen to have a lavalier mic that plugged into my iPhone already in my bag. And I had lights and stands and a tripod and a case for my iPhone. So rather than canceling the day's shoot, which I had five people lined up to just come and just come one after another and shoot their interviews. I was like, I'm not canceling a day shoot. I said, fuck it. You know, I'm just going to shoot these interviews myself. So I set up what I wanted. I got what I wanted. And I turned it into the uh, post-production guy, my dad. And he goes, 
I'm actually impressed. It actually looks it looks different than the other interviews you were getting, but that's a good thing. Not every interview needs to look uniform because it's a documentary. But he says some of the choices you were making with those interviews were it was done with a very odd, unique perspective that gave it a fresh feel. Um, and it gave me the confidence when you're hearing from a seasoned pro, also your dad, because, you know, most people want or, or they appreciate the uh, accolades and, and flowers that their parents give them and the compliments. So yeah. because my dad happens to be a colleague, and uh, he's giving me uh, those positive uh, reassurances about my choices. It's like, oh, my instincts are paying off. This is the choice I made artistically, and I'm getting people that do this, you know, person that does this all the time or used to do all the time, telling me that was a good choice. Yeah. So I kept making more choices and more choices. And so <laughs> I ended up... Um, working there's a there's a place in in town in jacksonville called creative veins it's an acting school but they do contests and and workshops and things and twice a year they do these horror festivals or film festivals one they do it at, at halloween and one they do it at, at christmas and they give you all kinds of wacky things they give you you kind of uh you stick your hand and and, and you draw you know, a genre and, you know, they give you a prop you have to use and certain key things like a character or a line of dialogue or whatever they give you. Kind and of like the 48. Kind of like the 48, but they give you several weeks. They don't just give you 48 uh. hours. Um, so when I went and did, uh, cause I, I did a 48 in Orlando this past year and we won, you know, go figure. We went to another city and we just won. You know that was that was very humbling to just no, go to someone else's. Just go to someone else's backyard and, uh, and 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 sandbox and, and just win. You know that was uh, roommates, right? Yeah, the, the 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 musical, the effing musical, as we called it. Yeah. Um, so there was a gal that I have known for a couple of years that worked with me a few times, and she needed she needed help on one of the film shoots she was doing for the, um, the creative veins, uh, the, the Halloween festival, they needed a cinematographer. And so she asked me if I would do it. And I said, sure. So I came back from, from the awards having just won, you know, the, uh, you know, Orlando. And I wasn't like, fly, you know, like telling other people about me winning, you know, they always say, let other people hype you. Don't, hype yourself that's bad and they me, did you know? <laughs> no they hyped it they did um it was very humbling they did uh because i walked on set she knew that i had won um but everyone else was like you know it was like a slow clap kind of thing they they were like hey hey we heard about you i'm like i just got here how have you heard about me she go and jill's like oh i told them all about your stuff and i was like oh shucks you know just let me go hide in a corner now you know thanks but um when i walked on set they knew me as a cinematographer and they just associated that my work, we, what I won, but I had to remind them, Oh, I wasn't the cinematographer of the one that won. But they said, well, no, but you're a director. So you already know, you know, what works and what doesn't. But I had to remind the director, I'm here to service what you want. Just because I'm a director doesn't mean that I'm going to bring that skill set here and do, you know, that job here. Oh yeah. But she trusted enough of what my ideas were. Well, here's the script, or these are the kind of shots I'm thinking. What are your ideas? You know, what are my ideas? She asked, she said, and I said, well, you're the director. She goes, no, 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 but I want to see your ideas. So, so I said, well, I was thinking if you want to do this, we could point the camera here, or we could, instead of have, you know, if you're trying to achieve all this in one day, why don't we try to do X, Y, and Z? And this would be our art, more artistic we could combine shots or do something that is a pan or a move or, you know, do what X, Y, and Z. So we did that. There was, she was happy with the work. Um, it screened at the creative veins festival. We got some feedback, you know, some, there was some, you know, uh, little accolades that some of the other people in, in the cast and crew got for their work, which was great. Um, then um, there was, there's a guy in town 
uh, Chitty might know of them if he doesn't know them directly. His name is Durden Godfrey. Mm -hmm. So he he does that TTFT, and he used to work with Josh all the time and Chad years ago doing stuff. But um, so for the LOL, his idea was to do a mock film shoot kind of thing. He goes, I want to do a short film about a film shoot that can't actually get off the ground. We keep trying to do these scenes and things keep getting in our way and we can't achieve what we want, but I want to do it as a mockumentary. And they said, well, we want you to shoot it. So I showed up with my iPhone and my rig and all my goodies, my toys. And I got to shoot this mockumentary for Durden and his crew in the LOL. I got nominated for uh, best cinematography, which um, I didn't need to win it to actually feel good about the fact that I was just nominated, which, you know, spoiler alert, I didn't win, which, but I didn't need to win because just, just knowing that I would, that, that people appreciated the work good. And I had people coming up to me at the awards and saying, it doesn't matter that you didn't win. You got nominated. That's something. And just doing that just kept motivating me to try to do more. Um, and then, you know, I got asked to be, the cinematographer for the same team again for the the Christmas one for Creative Veins. Now I had fun doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, it, every time I think I know everything, you know, I, I I keep I keep growing with each project and learning, and and of course when you work with new people, they push you to grow more. So okay, yeah. we we know a little bit about. Uh, being nominated oh yeah yeah maybe we should have gone maybe we should have gone to orlando with our shit <laughs> what's orlando with our uh with our show <laughs> this, is I don't know if you, this is something you probably won't hear a lot of winners say there was so many good films that were also nominated in addition to ours <clears throat> that when it came down to the top three because they, they get they have five nominations right nominees so that just like with the jack civil one they're like and the third place winner is and they called the third place winner and me and my friend david who was the co-producer he was acting in it um we were like wow that film is only third place we liked it a lot we thought it was going to get higher placement and then they're like and the second winner the second place is and then they listed another film we we're like huh that film is second place. So when we get uh, time slowed down, because when it got to, it's like, and the winner is, well, it could have been us or two other films. And those two other films were also good. We felt it's an, it, it, it sucks that you can only have one winner because we thought as much as we were happy that we got, you know, picked to win that we were like, on a good day, another one of those other films could have beat us. I mean, those were really good films. So I don't think it's imposter syndrome. We're happy we won, but those are judges. And if I was one of the judges, I would have the third or second place winners. I they could you could have easily made one of them a winner. I mean, they were so good. I have a um, sort of a, a similar situation happened to me where I was uh gosh I don't even remember what it was for but um I was in something and afterwards you know there were awards and it get you know time for best supporting actor and you're just like you know this is a lot of fun we're in an auditorium filled with acting people and you know handing out awards for these things that we just did and then uh, they're like best supporting actor the winner is Joshua Chitty. I was like, oh, that guy has the same name as me. <laughs> and, and it wasn't until the rest of the team was like, no, dude. Yeah, get your ass up there. You. <laughs> like, get up you. There. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? Why? I don't believe that guy at all. I know he's acting. Oh, my God. Uh, I was in a... um. There's a, there's a filmmaker, uh, Jay Palmer. You might have seen his stuff at the LOL at yeah. um, 48. He, he does wow. a lot of really awesome stuff. And 
we um i was an extra in a short film that he did uh, recently and they were shooting a party scene and uh tom Seidel was there and justin mann and they were doing uh you know uh, the camera and and uh, uh tom Seidel was just pushing the dolly you know you know so we we're doing this party scene and he had me and a bunch of people you know just being extras and they were putting marks on the ground based on and they wanted to do the 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 grease shot about the cameras going down the line and as the cameras going down the line everybody's parting like the cameras parting just as soon as the camera clears them so the camera can keep getting past them to clear 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 to make the line so they can get to the end of the shot but it's a choreographed thing you have to practice it a lot to get the marks just right and then you probably only do maybe two takes of it because you've already got it down so in the scene you're supposed to act like there's music but i guess it was uh mos because they actually were playing the music so they weren't gonna have dialogue but i can't dance like i i actually can't dance but nobody knew that now they do spoiler alert i royce can't dance but I was like, but nobody knows that. So I decided my character can't dance. So, but it's very liberating when you're under a mask or under transformed, you know, under the veil of um, that you can do something because you're not being yourself. So I was like, I'm going to give him the worst version of a horrible dancer. I mean, I made Elaine Bennis's little kicks from Seinfeld look good. I mean, I was bad, uh, but bad, good, because I had no sense of rhythm. I had no sense of gender or societal norms because I was doing this and I was doing this, but I was doing that where I was looking over at guys doing it. I was looking at girls doing it. I was just a- a- playing air guitar dancing with anybody who was around. And so cut to um, he the director told me, by the way, your bad dance is in the film. (laughs) So apparently doing this business actually is is in the film and the audience, the audience is going to be like, oh, the character can uh, the character is just letting himself go, you know, reckless abandon, you know. Like he didn't care. It's like, well, I really just can't, I can't dance. So I was just going to lean into that for the character and just give him a performance. Would you say it was like a standout uh, moment in the, uh, in the production? Like, I mean, like, did, like, did it catch like the attention of anyone that was filming or? Well, yeah, actually it's funny. Uh, you must be psychic because uh, that was an anecdote that I had in the back pocket that, in case you asked. Um, so my friend David, he was in the back next to Justin waiting for his turn to be on camera. And Justin knows David and no- Justin knows me. And as I'm dancing and cutting it up and just being ridiculous, Justin looks over at David and goes, wow, look at Royce, get it, getting it, <laughs> you know, because I-, I didn't give a shit. I completely didn't give a shit in character. And I was willing to be as completely ridiculous and non-societal conformity, you know. Yeah. My character didn't have any one preference. My character was dancing and vibing with everyone. So Okay. Josh, you look like you want to ask something over there, like just staring stoically while I'm mute. Again, don't want to interrupt. Don't want to you know, okay. me, no, no, you can flow. interrupt me. Uh, I, I get long-winded, and sometimes I need a little, uh, you know, just, uh, you know. It's not about interrupting, just like, just this, this stare. Shut up, Brandon. Anyway. That see? stare that you do, that just like <laughs> long stare. Looks like this. The audio listeners are going to love this. With a mute. And then you start talking, and it's like, I'll just hear... I'm not on mute now. I know you're not. You know now. Okay. Nope. I, you know, are there listeners there's... that only have an audio version? Yeah. Um, the show is, uh, you know, it's live, of course. It's available on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch. You know, for the video. Hey, look at us. We're doing video thingies. And then yeah. um, 
for people that like to download and listen on the go. And you know, you can find it on Spotify and anywhere, you know, you get yeah. your fine podcasts. Yeah, I really wish my Alexa still had the Samuel uh, L. Jackson voice on it because uh imagine like an episode where we're talking to Samuel L. Jackson getting responses from him about things. I think uh, at some point though, with this new uh sad contract we'd actually have to start paying him so maybe it's a good thing we don't have sam jackson voice on the show anymore oh fair enough. I, i'm wondering can maybe you can speak to this especially brandon if being out in la yeah what's up? if a person just does a loose impersonation of somebody but it's obvious they're doing that person's voice but it's a satire is that considered do is it that considered their voice? It's parody. It's all this. It's just parody. And everybody that does the I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing, you know, like anybody that's trying to do jewels from pulp fiction, that's yeah. that's the Samuel Jackson voice. That's the oh, yeah. thing. Well, yeah, when we look look at uh things like in Living Color, there's um there's a like a, a realer story on Facebook that's making its rounds. And it was from uh when Paul Rubens got himself arrested in that theater way back in the nineties and Jim Rest Carrey. Huh? Nothing. Oh, but uh, Jim Carrey uh, did a skit dress and so dress and impersonating uh, Pee Wee Herman. Yeah. So it's like, it's just, it's just parody. That's all it is. It falls under parody. If you're just like mimicking somebody or like just doing their voice. You know. I wonder how, how do they know? Cause Okay. Weird Al is doing mm -hmm. parody songs. People know because he's doing, he's replacing the lyrics and the songs are wacky. But is it a parody if it's not funny? No. No, it's, it's like, it's just like, I mean, it's just pretty much like a, uh, like, if it's just pretend to be like, you know, to have that, it's a speech pattern. That's all it is. Speech pattern, voice, and things like yeah. that. I mean, there are people that I have a similar speech pattern to. Josh has a very similar speech pattern to a few, quite a few people I know out here. Uh, I so, don't think so. Yeah, see, I this one sounds just like that. He's a uh, you know homeless guy in Venice Beach, but uh, yeah, that's what nice try to get away. Nice, nice attempt to get away, get around that little you know thing there, Josh. But you do, do you ever like, uh, of myself. Do you ever run into um, people that have any degree of fame? living out there and working in the business that you might be at Starbucks getting a coffee or being oh, yeah. somewhere and you happen to bump into someone who's like, Oh shit, that's, that's such and such. Oh yeah. Multiple times, multiple times. What's the um, etiquette that generally the celebrities, if they're not, if they're not on the job and they're just trying to live their life, they're getting a fucking cup of coffee or whatever is the general consensus is don't even say hi to them. They don't want to be bothered. Or mean, how, I, how do you gauge that? Hmm. I mean, honestly, with me, I don't get starstruck. Um, I've, I've, there's this place out here called the um, Cantina of Scum and Villainy. It's where Kevin Smith, Kevin uh, Smith, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, they they host their podcast there and everything like that. Uh, I've been there multiple times. I've run into Seth Green multiple times there, and uh, just first time I ran into him, I, uh, you know, he was outside. He was getting bum rushed by fans when he stepped outside to just get a uh, just get away from like a crowded bar. Um. I stepped outside to smoke and you know, like, Hey man, love robot chicken. He's like, Oh, robot chicken loves you too. I'm like, Oh, that's cool. Like I, I ran to him like way back in the day when I worked at MTV where he said the same thing. Like, Oh yeah. I love family guy. And like, you know, like Seth, uh, you know, like um, Seth and Fred was like, Oh, family guy loves you too. So it was, it was just like a call back to that, like, which cracked me up. Uh, but I ran into him um, a few times there because it's like one of his spots you actually have a few celebrities that go there like you know these themed places out here uh the beetle house la i've seen uh like i've seen celebrities at the beetle house uh it's just like a you know uh like it's 300 dollars per like you know for the night basically for course dinner and tim burton themed restaurant uh freak show beetle beetle juice is hosting the damn thing so you have here like i'm gonna go out here but like the general consensus from what i see is like when i ran to uh seth green the second time I was just like, "Hey, man, love your work." Like, "Oh, thanks." And I walked away. That's it. The I work just, loves you too. Yeah, work loves you too. But um, what I say is, like, if you just like acknowledge that they that you think that they're doing a good job for the most part, the ones I dealt with, I said stuff like that too. Has been a very 
positive reaction. Like, hey, yeah, thank you, man. Uh, I forget his name. The British dude that uh, plays Lucifer in the show Lucifer uh, oh, ran yeah. to him. Ran to him at a uh, Runyon Canyon going for a hike. And uh, yeah, did you? find him a costume and say how come she didn't know for three years i, I didn't did. acknowledge i did i did i thought it was like love love lucifer that detective is the dumbest detective in la county three years she didn't, she didn't know you're lucifer and i just kept walking he just started laughing uh it's just like it took her three sucks. damn years <laughs> what sucks is you have people that they get to uh any level of fame i mean I'm not a conspiracy theory nut, but there's so many people that have certain levels of fame that it's, it's a, probably a good idea not to besmirch them. So we just say in general, there's people that are celebrities that are talk show hosts or they uh, they are considered the richest woman in America, in the world, you know, oh, yeah. whatever, whoever that might be. But uh, Oprah Winfrey. Oh, I didn't say I didn't say that name. Oh, I but, did. Uh, no, but um but you hear that there's so many people that are very famous and they got famous because of, you know, well, it takes fans to make you famous. Absolutely. And so, yeah. but these people that if you work on their staff, even in the morning, passing them in the hall, you, you can't even say good morning to them. They don't. In fact, if they don't speak to you first, you're not allowed to talk to them. And yeah, they claim ones. that's because they're if if they're walking down their hall, they have a they have a place they're going to, and their mind is on a million other things, and they don't want to be distracted or bothered. So if they stop to say hi to you, then you can say hi. But you actually will get in trouble or fired if you speak to certain of these hosts and and interfere and bother them. Oh yeah, and I I can't. It's a Jeff Lopez to say has what you do if you you were still. Jennifer Lopez says it in uh, her clause where, um, like, I think what she was doing, she was um, helping out with American Idol for a little bit. I think it was Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. Was it Jennifer Lopez? Yeah. Okay. She has it. She had, she had, and, uh, she had in her clause where if you were on the crew, you could not look her in the eye. Uh, Dr. Phil, if he is walking down the hallway, you were to step to the side and let him walk past you. You don't, get out of my way. Okay. Yeah. Don't, don't walk. Uh, don't Love walk. Her. Steve Harvey's the same way. Oh yeah, I, I I don't know. I've never I've never I only know what I've heard of with these people from. I don't know how anybody them. can make um, eye, con eye contact with Steve Harvey. Uh, I'd just be staring at a mustache. The whole yeah, the mustache. Yeah, mustache and big old muscle and looking ears. But the thing is, is still um, with a few of these celebrities. I mean, look at Ellen DeGeneres. Like she's listed as being a much less nice person than she plays herself off to be. Uh, but but look at me, for the I'm most dancing. part. Yeah. For the most part, from what I've seen out here, the people that I've run into, the celebrities I've run into, or even have spoken to, um, have been very just as like I mean, I don't, I don't hound them, uh, but I've seen people like, oh my god, that's this person. They're running towards them and everything else. Uh, the only time I've ever gotten any disgusted look by anyone, it was not from a celebrity. It was from an admirer of a celebrity, and that was from when Betty White passed away. Um, Oh God! That was only because I won a bet that she would not make it out of 2020 alive. Um, and my reaction to finally winning a bet—it's um, sad that she passed away. Oh, you say that now, but I, I, I was saying it then. It's very—I I know. I was like, I'm owed a lot of money right now because we finally put money down on this one. And that's been like a long-running thing for like. 12 years with me and my friends like oh yeah but it, like what, what's your what do you foresee happening in like this year i was like one friend's like oh uh, this is going to happen another friend this is going to happen jags are going with the super bowl this is like man what do you think uh betty white's going to die it's it, it looks like it's her time and this has gone back for like 15 years now just as a as a long-running gag this this particular year in 2021 we actually put money on it Oof. and i won because it was December, it was December thirty first. It was December. It was December thirty first, and uh, I just <laughs> there was a helicopter on West uh, and on um, in West Hollywood. 
with people gathered like down the street. I thought someone got hit or something like that. And I also was like, what, what's going on? I was like, Betty White died. I'm like, oh my God, I won the bets. And it's just like, <laughs> I had to walk away because I was getting like dirty, dirty looks. Uh, I just, it was just like, just, you know, brain to mouth, no filter, no nothing, just poof, like just came right out. Uh, I was a very, very, then I never collected the money because I felt really horrible about pursuing that. Um, you know, it is a lot of money. But still, um, th th that's the dirtiest look I've ever gotten from anyone out here. But when it comes to other things, like as far as celebrities out here, I, I've like most of the time, if you just like give them the respect, knowing that they're just people with a much more a, a much higher paying job that's just cooler than yours, they're laid back. They're actually for the most part really cool. Yeah, some of them are dicks, but you know what sucks is some people they may never get the opportunity to meet that celebrity again. So they forget that these people are just regular people. And they're like, I don't know if it's considered 100% selfish, but those people that are like, I may never get a chance to meet this person again. So I want to talk to them and try to make an, a, a, a moment out of it, an experience of it. And the other person, the celebrity, it might be just in a hurry to get a cup of coffee and go. So yeah. you might be... Uh, interfering with what they had planned so they might be unintentionally rude to you and it might completely ruin your now your impression of who this celebrity is when you when they're human like us the regular people just like us so you've put them on this pedestal you're like oh my god i'm gonna meet kevin smith or i'm gonna meet whoever and you meet them and maybe you're meeting them when they're preoccupied or they're having a bad day or whatever and they're not entirely a dick to you but they're not 100% nice. And then you misinterpret what they mean. Uh, give oh. you a little anecdote. Um, so I went up to um, New Jersey huh? uh, for my birthday several years ago. And, you know, I went into Red Bank, New Jersey. And my wife and I, we went and we were like, oh, there's a the comic book shop here. And this is owned by Kevin Smith. Yeah, the Secret Sesh. Yeah. So we went in there. And I really don't know who the celebrity, who this person was. So I'm, I'm not claiming to point a finger, but I can tell you the experience I had. So I went in there, my wife and I, and uh, we knew that they also shot a uh, part of Chasing Amy down the street at a record shop. And mm -hmm. there was a park that they shot this. So there was some things around Red Bank besides the secret stash. So we went in there and we were going to buy like a little memorabilia tchotchke. And they, I think they had a map of where to find other stuff you know, where to find the quick stop, you know, in the Highlands, you know, and where to find all this stuff. And so there was a guy behind the counter. He's got a really big beard. So I didn't recognize his face. And so first I said, you know, hey, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, great stuff here. Big fan. Oh, yeah. Thanks, man. You know, just, you know, just whatever, you know, whatever. And then as I'm checking out, I, you know, said, so I hear they shot some of the Kevin Smith movies around here. And he, and he stopped and took a beat. And he looked at me and he goes, get the fuck out of here. What kind of fan are you? Huh? I thought you were a fan. A fan would know where they shot this stuff. And he completely was like, he went from being cordial to, and I haven't been up in New, New England, New York, New Jersey area for a long time. So I forget that up there, they don't have the Southern charm kind of oh, thing. No, no. Uh, yeah, I was, so I was raised there, in New Jersey. We do, we definitely do not. No, so up there, they say, hey, go fuck yourself. You know, or if you lived in Boston, it's like, hey, go fuck yourself. So, you know, but so basically, you know, he was on one hand, probably just being cheeky in his own way. But at the same time, he was like, he went from the fact that I was that I was a fan to now I was being ignorant as a fan. He's like, what kind of fan are you? If you were a fan, you would know where, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I left with that experience of, huh. I went into the celebrity shop and there was somebody that worked there that I have a sneaking suspicion that he's probably been in some of the movies. You know, I don't know. But um, he, he treated me in a way that I wasn't expecting. He might have just been cheeky 
are trying to be like, oh, I'll just give them a taste of the movies, you know, by giving some of that irreverent Jersey flavor. But um, I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that where you met somebody who may or may not have been a celebrity or Bill Murray. what was your experience with Bill Murray? Uh, it didn't start off good. Um, I had a relative that worked at his family's restaurant um, in St. Augustine. Oh yeah. The, the, Mur- so, the Caddyshack. The Murray brothers Caddyshack. And he was, um, you know, he was there. You know, he was, I mean, he, he, pre- he golfs at that nearby uh, like golf course quite like whenever he's in Florida and he, he does, attend he does tend to that restaurant uh once in a while so but he was at the bar doing his thing um having some food and i ordered a drink for him whatever his next drink was and my relative comes over and says like he's not interested I'm like okay okay well then you know send him a coke i don't know uh so Coke goes over there and then a Coke comes back over to me and like gets put on my table. And it's like he said he's not interested. He said thank you, but he's not interested. I look over and Bill Murray's just like just like just just you know, waves it off like whatever. I walk over there, it's like, okay. Walk over the drink. I was like, very big fan of Ghostbusters, but bigger fan of Groundhog Day. Here you go. And the life aquatic was probably my favorite movie you've ever been in. I walk back to my table. That's it. And uh just Relatives like, oh, you're gonna get me fired. I'm like, no, oh, I won't. Like, <laughs> you're not being the dickhead here. I am. <laughs> and uh, I have a, uh, I have a napkin from uh, the Caddyshack, where it's just like, stop sending me drinks. <laughs> but uh, thanks for being a fan. It's just signed Bill Murray on it. I look, over, look at the napkin. I look over at him, and he just like holds up the soda. He's just, just sipping on it. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Closest I ever got to meeting my uh, my idol, but I, I think it's probably the closest I've ever actually been to being starstruck. But um, honestly, I, I can't think. Of, I'm trying to think of just one experience with a celebrity that I might have met out here that I've, I've had a bad experience with, and you know, I, I keep going up to Runyon Canyon at times, hoping that one of these days I'll run into Kevin Smith while he's like taking his daughter's dog for a hike, but. Um, you know, because he hikes up there quite often, but it's just like one of those deals where it's like I've, I've only met like I've only run into like a few celebrities out here. Like I see them out and about, but I don't really acknowledge them. I just treat I just treat them as I would treat any passing stranger. Just let them be. I know, like, you see it a lot out here. You see people are, like, you see people that know these people are celebrities. They just ignore them. It's largely the tourists out here that go ape shit over these people that you know they see in movies and magazines and TV shows. So no. Yeah. There's only two that only two celebrities out there that I would just love to run into and just on the street and be able to have at least five minutes to just talk to them. Is, and you've uh, already Kevin, met me, so. Oh, well, <laughs> well, Kevin Smith uh, kept the you know actual Kevin Smith, not one of his other people that works with him, but um, Kevin Smith and Tarantino. Oh yeah, but I've, but I've heard you don't want to bother Tarantino when he's out and about because he doesn't want to be bothered too much. Oh yeah, I don't know. Like, I really, I really don't know. Um, like I said, I've seen a few people out and about. Like, I mean, Santa Monica. I've seen Jason Siegel out there with like a few other people, like a few of his friends, and you know, I've, I've seen quite a few people out here just like out doing their thing. It's like I just let them be. I mean, as I feel like they get enough hassle from people acting like they're at a like acting like they're exotic animals in a zoo, as opposed to just again people that have a cooler job that pays a lot more than anything I could ever make. So um, that's really it. But um, I can tell you about the time I got starstruck once. Yeah, was it when you saw me for the first time? And that Twice McDonald's then. at the Walmart. Twice then. We've already told our story. We have, and you know what? It never gets old, sweetheart. I love how we met. It's certainly a wonderful meet, cute. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, many many years ago, I was. Yeah, it's been 20 years. Ah. Anyway, I was uh, I was at the Warp Tour. Remember the Warp Tour? No, $20 yeah, all day bands for 12 hours. You know, it's, it's such a great time. And uh, 
I was just hanging out there by myself back when I felt good about doing such things and not lonely at all and saw a line. And I was like, oh, wow, there's a line. I should stand in it. So I went and stood in the line. Didn't know what I was standing in line for. And uh, not really paying attention. I'm looking around. And then uh, I finally get to the front of the line. I turn and I look and I'm like, oh. Because sitting in front of me across a table is Real Big Fish. The band. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know who they are. And I'm just like, jaws like a gape. And uh, Aaron Barrett stands up, gives gives like a smirk, and just juts out his hand. I'm like, how does that happen? He's like, let's go. And then um, um, that was that. I, was, I just, I'm, what? How does that happen? Uh, I'm a fan, in case uh, you guys could tell. Big fan. Big fan. Real big fan. And the only celebrities the, I've ever met are uh, going to horror conventions and, you know, they're at the tables and they sign your stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, that counts. It does count that you met them, but they're literally sitting at a table designed for you to meet them. You're not you're not bumping into them. Mm -hmm. They're there for that reason. <clears throat> well, that yeah, that's true. Have, have I ran into any wild uh, celebrities out wild the street. celebrities <laughs> i were they unleashed <laughs> i don't if i have i don't recall it's uh i i don't usually retain these things uh mostly because i don't know it, it's it's just so i'm i'm just going to go ahead and say probably not because I don't see many famous people on the west side of Jacksonville uh, very often. Not not in my neighborhood, anyway. Uh, from what I understand, uh, John Travolta has a house like yep. down the street from where, where my grandmother used to live. In Orange Park, um, I think it's Orange Park High High School. Um, there was a couple. There's been a couple of famous bands that have come from Jacksonville. Not just Leonard Skinner, but I mean, you had Molly Hatchet, you had Leonard Skinner, 38 Special. Um, Yellow Card, then, Limp Biscuit, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think Red's Jumpsuit Apparatus, they yep. went to Orange Park High, I think. I think. Um, but it's interesting how, uh, you know, Jacksonville has been the home of lots of famous people that have come out of Jacksonville. Oh, but, yeah. but this is the thing that I've learned in talking to so many people doing the doc and other stuff is in some circles, if you say you're from Jacksonville, they scoff. They go <clears throat> because to the outside world, they don't necessarily think of, you know, a lot, they don't associate Jacksonville with um, being the birthplace of, you know, anything. anything. Yeah. Anything that's important to them. But I mean, Fucking Skinner was from here. That alone should be worth something. Uh, but Southern Rock and New Metal, Jacksonville. Yeah, right. Right. I mean, it's Jacksonville. Just, I mean, and you mentioned Travolta had a house here. Um, that's why a couple of John Travolta movies were shot in, in uh, Jacksonville. Uh, you know, I mean, you had Basic. There was shot. At I Camp auditioned Land. for Basic. Well, not an audition, but I went to that cattle call. But yeah, I mean, you. Uh, they shot at Camp Landing. I mean, they shot that because Travolta's from here. He's from somewhere in Florida. Um, and, uh, you know, I know Burt Reynolds was from Florida. That's why they shot the longest yard here in the 70s, because he's from Vero Beach, you know. Florida State. Yeah. So, I mean, Pretty it's cool. amazing that you find out all these celebrities are actually from Jacksonville area or North Florida. I do have one. I have one. I have I have a uh, 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 out in the wild story, and and okay, I'll, I'll make it really quick. Uh, I was at Orange Park uh, Mall, um, with at the time my my stepson, and 
uh, we wanted to go to GameStop. And there was like this huge crowd of people outside the GameStop. And we're like, we, we, want, we want to go buy stuff at the GameStop. Is there like a line? What What's going on here? And we get, you know, push a little bit closer to the store. And we realized the store is empty. Yeah, People are just crowded out like in the, in the general mall area. And like the store has like two people in it and plus staff. So I'm like, okay. So we just walk in, you know, grab the stuff we want to head to the counter where this guy is and, um, you know, chat him up for a bit uh, because the, the, the staff is like, like bending over backwards to make this, make, make sure this kid, because, you know, to me, he seemed like a kid, uh, probably was a kid. I don't know. Um, but, you know, they were bending over backwards to make sure he was taken care of. And then uh, he leaves, and when he goes, the crowd goes with him. Oh, wow. And I'm like, what just happened? And the store manager's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I don't know. (laughs) And and one of the younger employees was like, you were just talking to rich homie Quan. I'm like, oh. Who is that? who yeah like he's a rapper i was like oh oh Oh, okay okay (laughs) that's sure oh and you were talking to him yeah you know he was in line yeah i did what i normally do and if things are taking a while wow it's taking a while Yeah. yeah make friends it's better than just standing there quietly or sitting on a podcast just staring at each other like this That's what we but do. But you know what? As much as I would love to go all night, uh, I think we've we've hit our time. It's already like an hour and a half. Yeah, we, we hit 90. Oh wow, we did. Okay. Yeah. So uh before time. we get out of here, Royce, if there's any way for people to follow you on social media or anything you want to plug promote before we get out of here, by all means feel free to do so. Well, um, I have two feature movies on Tubi, and you can also rent them on Amazon uh, uh, Video, but they're on Tubi. Uh, one is called In Utero, just like just like the Nirvana album, but it's not about Nirvana. Um, but and then the other one's called Rapture. If you look those up and my name, Royce Freeman, because I think there's multiple movies with the name Rapture and In Utero and stuff, but. Um, but they're both grindhouse horror movies, so they're not for the faint of heart. They're not for the PC crowd for sure, because they were done down and dirty, Rob Zombie style, very seventies grit. So you know they're not they're not for, uh, they're not for they're not for they're not for the people that are they get offended easily. Um, they can find me on <clears throat> Vimeo. You look up Freeman Films, and they have a, just a channel there. And on Facebook, you can look up Freeman Films. Um, the link is Facebook, you know, dot uh, com. Filmmaker Royce Freeman is the link, but uh, the uh, it's just look up Freeman Films, and it's got my logo. It's a really cool '70s uh, old school logo. Um, and you can go, you can go on there, and you can see all the links to the the different videos and films where we haven't put up the 48 we did from Orlando yet because we're going to Lisbon in March uh, for film of Palooza. So we're figured after the ceremony and after all that, then we'll put it up. Um, but it's, it's that really one. fun. It, it's really fun. Um, it's a wacky good time. Uh, on my Facebook and Vimeo channel, you can see all kinds of, uh, short films and uh, promos and videos and stuff I've done. Um, Even though I've done those two uh, gritty horror movies, um, you know, I've done comedies and I've done wacky projects of all genres. So, you know, I like to try different stuff because that's how you stretch your muscles and, you know, you grow is get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Okay. What about us, Brandon? Where can people find the Wadcast? Oh, okay. I, I thought you were going to take the reins of that one this week. 
Well, you can follow you can find the Wadcast on uh, Instagram at Instagram.com backslash the Wadcast. Same with Facebook, Facebook.com backslash the Wadcast. Uh, or just go to the search uh, icon if you don't want to go onto a computer and use an actual web browser. Just go to the apps, just go to the search and type in the Wadcast. And you'll know us because we will have an icon that has the word the Wadcast in it. Um, but behind, like in front of the Wadcast is a picture of myself and Josh. Uh, except for except for on the Instagram page. The Instagram page is just a, the classic Wadcast logo, black uh, background, white banner with Wadcast writers, actors, directors written in it. Uh, you can also find us on threads. Uh, but that's pretty much uh, it. That's where you can find us. If you want to follow me, you're welcome to do so. I really I don't really follow back at all. Um, but uh, my username is right here in the box, uh, bjaxman1982. Type that in. You'll see a picture of my face with next to Josh. That is my profile picture. Yes, Josh, you were in my profile picture on Instagram. Uh, Facebook, forget it. I've got plenty of uh, friend requests in there. I'm, it's not going to happen. Um, but you can follow me on Instagram, bjaxman1982. Um, and yeah, that's really it. I guess you can also follow us on TikTok, but there's only like three videos on there so far. I've not had the time to keep up with all of our social media. Um, and as of right now, I don't have the money to hire some little, you know, pimple face kid to master our social media presence. So I have three in this house that I can then tell them to sleep. get to work. Uh, I will. Like, what's the point of having kids if you're not going to subject them to slave labor? That's what I've been saying. Then tell them to do it. I didn't know you wanted me to. Yes. Be like, my, yo, my kids, kids three can work or in your kit. My kid's three years old. So, yeah. you know, we're, uh, I guess eventually he will be a part of the family business. So eventually he'll be put to work. Yeah. Yeah. So by the time he's like, by the time he's seven, he's going to be out front cutting grass as an intern. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> that's where you can find us. Um, and Josh might be putting uh, his kids into uh, child labor camps to, uh, Get our social medias in check. So, Josh, I prefer your... child labor day spas. Okay, yeah, yeah. day spas sounds, sounds okay. a lot better than camp. <laughs> <laughs> but don't like forget, you can always go to wadcomedia.com to to find out yeah. what links are. I guess because that doesn't get updated at all. Yeah, no, that's a, it's all been the same for a while now. I don't know why I keep <laughs> Go to widecomedia.com. That's where you'll find all the links to the other stuff that we have. Oh, my God. Updated. And, uh, you know, if you want to buy something, hey, we got shirts and stuff. There's also a Patreon. Don't go to the Patreon because it'll make me have to do stuff. And I don't want to do stuff. <laughs> but... If you want to show your appreciation, get a shirt, you know, spend a couple of ducats. I would prefer <laughs> you, you have something like a, that you can hold in your hand. You make it sound like people are like listening to our show and then they're walking through a gift shop like they'd be in like in Cracker Barrel or something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Visit our Cracker Barrel <laughs> gift shop. Get a shirt. Wadcomedia.com. Maybe Dolly Parton's new album's there. I don't know. I listened to the Wadcast. All I got was this t-shirt. <laughs> Come on, guys! Don't be don't be assholes. Buy that wicked cool merch. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Royce. I oh, I didn't know how to say it. That's the way to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, buy your that shit. wicked cool merch. That wicked cool merch. Now, before we get out of here, there is one thing uh, left to do. Every week, Royce, I I give the kids out there, and by the way, I just call everybody kids. Again, hazard of the job. I I give everybody like a final message, a a sort of moral of the story, and this is this is how it goes. <clears throat> I hate this music. So Brendan much. hates the music, by the way, so much. Hey, remember, kids, the only thing standing between you and your dreams is you. You don't need permission to be creative. You don't need permission to be a creator. If you want to write, grab a pen, sheet of paper, start writing. If you want to direct, you got a phone, don't you? Most people do. 
get your shots in. If you want to act, there's lines everywhere. Just start reading them. All you got to do is start doing it. No one's going to tell you you're not allowed. And after time, who knows where that'll take you. But it all starts with you getting out of your own way. And that's it. I want to thank everybody for joining us here tonight for the Ycast episode number 160. Thank you, Royce, for being our very special guest. And dare I say, for your first visit of hopefully many more to come. Oh, yeah. I mean, I got uh, I'm a chatterbox and I love I got the gift of gab. So I love I would I welcome the opportunity to come back on and, and talk about other stuff. We should talk about other other films, you know, so, uh, other than my stuff. You know, we could it'd be, it'd be fun to talk about some films that are coming out, some films that are retro that we grew up on. That'd be fun. OK, you just That's described the podcast. <laughs> there you go. So uh, once again, thank you, everybody, for joining us here tonight. For those of you that are uh, watching and listening live, hey, it's late. Go to bed. For those of you that have uh, downloaded the show, don't forget to rate, review, subscribe. Smash that button. Uh, I don't know which one. Just start smashing buttons that things happen. And, Live uh, long and prosper. I don't know how to close it any better than that. Have a good night, everybody. Good night.